Aren't you glad that we serve a great God this morning? Say amen. amen. I read this this morning, and I wanted to share this with you. One of the guys that I, I grew up with actually sent this to me. And it says this, The greatest man in history had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degrees, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicine, yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried, yet he lives today. His name is Jesus. Aren't you thankful that the grave couldn't hold him? Think about it today. We serve a resurrected Savior who conquered death, who conquered hell, who conquered sin. And today, He desires to be in a relationship with you. I don't know about you, but that excites me this morning. We serve a living God. If you believe that this morning, say amen. 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 Today, we're going to be looking at two different men, two different disciples who seemed to fail God, yet God chose to use them in a mighty, mighty way. So this morning, if you have your scriptures, we're going to be talking about how failures brings faith. How God wants to take your failure to increase your faith and for you to grow. If you have your scripture this morning, open to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 12. And the scripture reads this way. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But they entered. They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men, clothes gleam with white, stood before them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. I say amen. Remember, he told you why he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of men, into the hands of sinners, to be crucified. On the third day, he may be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back to the tomb, from the tomb, they told those who were with them, including the eleven, and all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary mother of James, the others who told the, told the apostles. But they did not believe the women because they seemed to be nonsense to them. Peter, however, got up and he ran to the tomb. He bent over, saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and went away wondering to himself what had happened. Could you imagine on that day what a day that must have been like? The disciples had taken their entire lives. For three years they had followed Jesus. They had seen all the great miracles that he had done. He had healed the sick. The deaf were able to hear. He had raised Lazarus and people from the dead. They've seen all these great miracles. They were expecting a king. They were expecting someone to come in to save them in an earthly manner. For three years, they had followed everything. And yet in one moment, their whole lives were turned upside down. The one that they thought, who was going to be the savior of the world, was dead in a tomb. Peter was sitting here. One of the disciples that have followed him, and just, just before this had happened, in the upper room was there, there eating together. Jesus looks at Peter and says, Peter, Satan is asked to sift you like sand. He said, but when you return to me, strengthen my disciples. He sits there and he tells Peter, Satan's coming after you, Peter. And Peter looks directly at the Lord. And think about this for just a moment. He says, Lord, everybody else may run and leave you. I never will. Lord, I will follow you all of my life. I'll follow you to prison. I'll follow you to death. 
whatever it takes, Lord, I will follow you. And I love Jesus' response. He goes, oh, Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Lord, everybody else may deny you, but I won't. So could you imagine, as Jesus is taken away, Peter follows along and all of a sudden, this little girl comes to him and says, hey, I know you, you're one of the disciples. And their culture and during this time, this woman had no testimony. She couldn't even be heard in courts. Anything she said would not even be considered legitimate. Yet Peter said, no, no it's not me. And just as Jesus had predicted three times before the rooster crowed, he would deny him. I never knew the man, he said. And at that point, Scripture says that's when Jesus' eyes locked with Peter's. Could you imagine the heartbreak, the disappointment? Here's Peter going, Lord, I will fight with you to the death. God, I'm all in. Yet just within a few moments, he had denied his Lord and Savior three times. For three days, he'd been walking around going, everything I put my hopes and my dreams into is gone. And even worse than that, before he died on the cross, he even said, I would deny him. And could you imagine the look as Peter gazed into Jesus' eyes, going, Peter, I still love you. And the disappointment, the heartbreak that Peter must have had, said, I know I felt my Lord. And then all of a sudden he hears these words from these women saying, hey, we went to the tomb. We saw with our own eyes, and the angels were there, and they told us, why are you looking for the, the living among the dead? Could you imagine they come running back? The others heard it. They said, hey, this doesn't make no sense. These women are crazy. But Peter, he had to find out for himself. Could you imagine as he's sitting there running to that tomb, all the thoughts that had to be going through his head? Scripture said he got up and ran. I'm sure he had a lot of disappointment in himself. Feelings that he had felt miserably. You see, a lot of us, we walked in here this morning and we came because it was Easter Sunday. We came with our family or somebody invited us for whatever reason we came. But we walked in here and we're saying, you know what, I've got a lot of failures in my life. I can identify with Peter. I've made a lot of mistakes. Life's not been always easy. I've had a lot of failures, Pastor. Well, can I tell you something? Every one of us can identify with that. I've got a lot of failures in my life. A lot of things I wish I would have done differently. But aren't you glad that failures do not define us in life? You see, failures don't have to be final. I believe that God wants to use the failures that you have I believe that He wants to allow our failures to work in us and through us. You see, everybody experiences defeat in life. Everybody has failures. The book of Proverbs has a lot of insight into what causes failures. There are five different things that cause failures in our life, according to the book of Proverbs. And this morning, if you have your bulletins, if you flip on the back, we have an outline if you want to follow along with us. And if you didn't get a bulletin this morning, you want one if you raise your hand. We have some ushers in the back who will be glad to get you a bulletin if you want to take notes this morning. But we're going to talk about five different things that cause us failures, according to the book of Proverbs. Number one in your outline says this. We fail when we don't plan ahead. It's like the old saying, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. Proverbs 27 12 says this A sensible man watches for problems ahead and prepares to meet them but the simple minded man never looks and suffers the consequences Ask yourself this question this morning, are you simple minded? Some of us have the tendency to act impulsively yet the sensible man plans ahead, scripture says the impulsive person never looks ahead and suffers the consequences. Think about it for a moment. One of the reasons we fail is we simply just don't plan ahead. Think about Noah for a moment. God says, Noah, 
it's going to rain and I want you to build this boat. Noah, there's going to be a flood that's going to wipe out mankind. And I'm going to give you this boat that I want you to build. Now stop and think about Noah for just a moment. The people during this time had never, ever seen rain. And so here's Noah going around saying, hey, I want to tell you guys there's this bad flood that's coming. You better get prepared and you better get ready. Now, Noah had to do a little bit of planning and preparation. As a matter of fact, the scripture says it took 120 years to build this ark. You're talking about some planning ahead. You're talking about some work. Could you imagine for just a moment all the preparation it would have took Noah to get the ark ready and all the animals on the ark? Not only that, but could you imagine the ridicule that Noah was going through? As Noah's sitting there and he's building this big ark and he said, hey guys, you guys better get ready. A flood's coming. They're going, Noah, you're an absolutely crazy old man. You're building this huge boat. You're getting all this food ready and you're going to bring all these stinking animals inside this ark and you're going to lock yourself up in there with your family. You're crazy, dude. Have you ever, have you ever been called by God to do something that seems much bigger than you are and everybody else is looking at you going, man, you're absolutely crazy. God wants you to do what? And you've got to step out of your comfort zone. You've got to go do something that you never planned to do and something that you may not have wanted to do, but God has called you to do it. For 120 years, Noah's building this ark. He's preparing ahead. And could you imagine, though, on that day, as Noah, God says, Noah, I want you to go into the ark. Get ready, it's going to rain. Noah goes into the ark. Think about this for just a moment. He goes into the ark and he seals the door. And not just Noah, but could you imagine the way his kids felt? Man, your dad's crazy. Some of you kids can understand that. If you're my kids, you probably hear that a lot. Man, your dad's crazy. What is he thinking? The ridicule. Could you imagine as Noah goes in there and seals the ark? It's, it's got to be the town spectacle. Here's this huge boat in the middle of the desert. There's no water around. All of a sudden, they're sealed up in there, and everybody's come out to see crazy Noah. What in the world? I wonder how long he's going to stay in there. And they're all standing around talking. But could you imagine all of a sudden the first raindrop fell from the heavens? And all of a sudden, for the very first time, they felt water run from their heads down their faces. Could you imagine the panic? The beating on the doors. As the rainwater comes down, now they're starting to scratch on the doors. They're trying to open the boat any way that they can. And Noah says it's too late. The door's been sealed. You see, I believe many people have fell in life because they simply don't plan ahead. If we don't plan to grow, if you don't plan to grow closer to God, it's never, ever going to happen. You will only be as close to God as you plan to be. If you have no plan to grow, guess what? It doesn't just happen. So if you're not planning to grow closer to God, and you don't have any disciplines, you have no routine, I'm going to tell you something, church, you're never going to grow closer to God. It doesn't just happen. Number two, we fail when we think that we've arrived. Proverbs 18.18 18 says this. Pride leads to destruction and arrogance to downfall. When we think we've all got it together, we better watch out. You're never going to get anywhere if you think you're already there. You see, many times in life we say, hey, I've got it figured out. Life's good. I'm okay. I'm going to tell you what. You're either humble in life or you're getting ready to get humbled. Because it will happen to you. None of us have it all figured out. The moment that you think you've got it figured out, you better start worrying. Because pride causes us to fall. One of the symptoms of pride is we don't think we need any advice. I've got it all together. I don't need anybody. Well, I've got some bad news for you. We're all sinners in here. And we're only saved by grace. If you ever walk into a church and you think you're better than somebody else, I've got news for you. You're in trouble. Get ready for a fall. 
I don't care who you are, if you've been going to this church much longer than I have, or if you walked in here for the first day, you're no different than I am. We're all sinners, and we're only saved by the grace of God. We've all fallen. We've all made mistakes. But it was Jesus Christ who willingly went to that cross, who died for our sin. I tell this to the church quite a bit, and, and, and I'll say it again today. How many of you guys have ever stole anything? You've taken a pencil that didn't belong to you, an ink pen, raise your hand. Okay. I, how many of you guys in here have ever told a lie? Just one of those little white lies. If you ain't raising your hand right now, you're lying now. How many of you guys or women have ever had a thought about somebody the opposite sex that you shouldn't have had? Don't raise your hand on that one. I say you raised your hand, that's okay. <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand on that one. I don't want to embarrass anybody in here today. How many of you ever been so mad about somebody? Going, I could kill that person. I'm so mad at them right now. Go ahead, raise your hand. You raise your hand on that, and the rest of you guys are lying too. It's okay. So right now we have a bunch of thieves in here. We have a bunch of liars in here. We have a bunch of murderers in here and a bunch of sexually immoral people. We can have an altar call right now and say amen. I want to tell you something. Everyone in here are sinners saved by grace. There's nothing in us of ourselves that deserves heaven. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice that died on the cross for us that makes us right with God. If we think we've arrived, we're going to fail. Number three. We fail when we're afraid to take risk. Proverbs 25, 29 says this. Fear of man is a dangerous trap. But to, trust the, but to trust in God means safety. The moment you start to worry about what other people think, you're doomed. It's a trap. The greatest failure is to fail to try. If God is for you, Scripture says... Who can be against you? You have to ask yourself, where am I placing my faith? You see, because God's going to ask you to do something that's much bigger than you. Trust me, I'm sure Noah didn't have much skill in building boats. But he said, God, I'll be obedient. You see, when God asks us to do something out of our comfort zone that seems so much bigger than us, God says, you know what, hey, by yourself you will fail. He said, but with me you never will. You see, the problem is that most of us, the reason that we fail in life is that we're afraid to take risks because we're dependent upon ourselves instead of dependent upon God. I told you guys at the beginning of the year, back in January, for two years, in my devotional book, I'd pray. And I was asking God for, for three things. Wisdom, vision, and direction. For two years, these are three things that I just continue to plan for. God, give me wisdom to do what you're calling me to do. Give me the vision to see what you're calling me to do. And give me direction on how we're supposed to do it. And for th two years, I'll pray these three things. And every day in my devotional book, every morning I, I get up, I begin to read Scripture, and I, I journal, and I pray, and I write down my prayers. And for, for two years, constantly. And then God started opening up this vision and said, you know what, Pastor Shannon, he goes, this is, this is what a calling that I have for the Eastgate Church of Nazarene. He said, first of all, he said, there's a lot of hungry people around you. He said, I'm calling the Eastgate Church to feed people. September, we're starting a compassion center right here in our church. Every week, we're going to feed hungry people. God is opening up doors for us to partner with the Food Bank of Feeding America, and God's just been opening up doors. It's been so beautiful to see how God's working, and September, we're kicking that off. The other thing we start to see, there's a lot of hurting people. They have hurts, bad habits, and hang-ups. And we started looking into all kinds of recovery ministries. And as we were looking through recovery ministries, we began to pray. And Pastor Greg, who's our Connect pastor, and I, we, we were sitting, we were talking, we were looking at these different recovery ministries. And um, as we began to look at this, where is God leading us to? And God opened up the door to celebrate recovery for our church. And so we've been having people training to do celebrate recovery. We've got people that are involved in celebrate recovery ministry. And the coolest part is, uh, of that whole thing is, about three years ago, Pastor Greg was teaching one of our children's Sunday school classes. And one of the little kids asked Pastor Greg, said, Pastor Greg, where's your wife? Pastor Greg said, I don't have a wife and I don't need one. And the wisdom of children looked at Pastor Greg and said, oh, Pastor Greg, you need a wife. We're going to start praying for you to get a wife. And I'm going to tell you, when kids begin to pray, 
God's ears get real big. And it wasn't long after that on a Thanksgiving, I never will forget, it was a Thanksgiving meal here. A, we do our Thanksgiving meal on Tuesday night before Thanksgiving every year for our community. And uh, there was a young lady by the name of Tina Blum who walked through her doors. She came with one of her good friends. And she walked up, she goes, Greg, I've got to introduce you to somebody. I want you to go out with Tina. And, and we had no idea that Tina had been running a recovery ministry, helping run a recovery ministry for nine years called Celebrate Recovery. And God brought Tina into Greg's life and Greg into Tina's life. And, and so Greg and I was there talking. I said, Greg, I said, um, I'm not the smartest person in the world, uh, but God's blessed you with a great woman in your life. And uh, she kind of has a background to celebrate recovery. So as we began looking at recovery ministries, God kind of opened the doors and we knew exactly where we were supposed to be going. And so we started praying, God, what is it that you have for us? So God said, hey, I want you to, to feed, feed hungry people. We realize Jesus says, you know what? Do this to the least of these. So we started praying. And then we started saying, you know what, God? Not only that, but Jesus said, hey, bring the little kids unto me. And for several years, God has really laid upon my heart that we needed a preschool here in our church. And we've been praying about this whole preschool thing and what we're supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. And um, through prayer and uh, some different things, God introduced us to another young lady by the name of Kathleen. And some of you guys met Kathleen last week. We just hired Kathleen. She'll be starting next week. Kathleen's going to be running their elementary school age children on Sunday mornings, but she's also going to be starting their preschool in January. And so we begin to realize something that God says, hey, I'm calling you to do things that are much bigger than you are. He said, if, you, if you'll do this to the least of these, if you'll reach out to hurting people, and you'll love children, God, this is what he promised us in the Old Testament. He said, I'll bless you. And I don't know about you, but I want to be in a place that's blessable by God. And as I begin to, as I begin to pray this, and I begin to write this in my journal, and I begin to look at this, and say, God, this is a great vision for somebody else, but not me. Because I'm going to be honest, I was scared to death. God, why in the world would you call me to do this? He said, the same reason I called you to pastor the Eastgate Church of Nazarene. It's not about you. And I begin to realize something. It's about all of us. You see, we had that group that came up here in front of the church this morning. This isn't a vision that God just gave to me. That's a vision for our church. You see, when we fail, when we're afraid to take risk, we realize this is much greater than we are. But aren't you glad that we serve a God that's much greater than us? And I don't know about you, but I look forward to the days when we have people going, Pastor, I'm so tired of these kids writing on the walls. We need some new carpets. They keep spilling Kool-Aid. That's a great thing to do. I'd much rather have noisy hallways than silent hallways. I believe the kids are not the future of the church. They are the church. If we miss one generation, we lose the entire church. So our next thing is we're trying to find a panel of about 15 preschool moms that don't go to our church. This is our next step. And I want to sit down with 15 preschool moms and say, you know, what do you want out of a preschool? What's important to you? And then we're going to share what's important to us. Sharing Jesus Christ with those kids. Number four in your outline says this. We fail because we give up too soon. The trouble with many people is that during trying times, they just stop trying. Failure is the path of least persistence. How many ball games have been won in the final seconds of a game because a team didn't give up? We're to keep on keeping on. Proverbs 15, 19 says, A lazy fellow has trouble all through life. You see, you never ever fail until you quit. Think about that. You never fail until you quit. The man who affected so many generations to come with his cartoon creations was once considered a failure. Walt Disney was fired by the editor in 1919 from his job at the Kansas City Star paper because he lacked imagination. The gentleman went on to look at Walt Disney and said, you have no imagination, and you have no good ideas. 
However, the man who bought us Mickey Mouse and a slew of other characters didn't stop failing there. His first go at business, he ended up bankrupt, but he still didn't give up there. You see, when God's called us to do something, we can't give up too soon. You see, failures do not define our life. We're going to fall, we're going to falter, we're going to fail at times, but we can't give up and we can't give in. Remember, God's not finished with you yet. Number five, we fail when we don't listen to God. The number one reason we fail is that we don't listen to God. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, There is a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. God's Word is filled with guidelines and principles to make our life all that God wants it to be. Scripture tells us exactly what God wants us to be, what God's called us to be. The problem is we don't listen to Him. Every year at the end of the year, at school year, we always do a graduation Sunday. And one of the things I always remind our students, and I even tell our parents, and I tell them this, and I hope if you're a parent or you're a grandparent in here today that you listen to this very closely, please stop telling your kids to be all they can be. You say, oh, Pastor Shannon, what in the world do you mean? You can't be all, all things that you want to be. You can't be all things to the world. You have just enough time to be what God's called you to be. God has placed a calling upon your life, every person in here. God has got something very specific for your life that He's called you to do. Fulfill that calling in life, and you'll have greater joy than anything that you can imagine. All of us have 24 hours in a day. We have just enough time to do what God's called us to do. Don't try to be something or do something that God's not called you to do. You'll live a life of misery. I don't care if God's called you to sweep streets for a living. Do it with joy. If God told one of his angels to go lead the choir and another one to go sweep the streets, they would both do it with joy because they're doing what the Lord has asked them to do in obedience. You see, stop trying to do all the things in life because so many people, they live their lives full of frustration, full of fatigue. They're tired. They're always busy. And they seem like they're never getting anywhere in life. The reason being is because they fail to listen to God. You see, the greatest failure in life is not having a relationship with God because we're simply too busy. You see, so many people have gotten it so wrong for so many years. People come to church and they think Christianity is all about a bunch of rules and regulations and it's so far from the truth. As a matter of fact, Christianity is all about one thing. It's all about relationship. You see this ring on my finger? I wear a wedding, wedding band. And it's a symbolism of marriage. This wedding ring, however, doesn't make me married. It's the relationship I have with my wife. You see, if I don't come home for several days and I don't talk to my wife for several days, what's going to happen to my relationship? So we're going to falter. It's going to begin to fail. You see, I can sit here and say I have a relationship with Jesus Christ, and I know all the facts, but if I have no relationship, the question is, do I really know him? You see, regardless of the cause in life, we all fall, we all fail. What matters the most is what you do when you fall. You see, God is more interested in your future than he is your past. You may have walked in here this morning saying, Pastor, I... It's been rough. And God says, that's okay, I still love you. He looked at Peter and said, Peter, I, I still love you. You see, that's the great thing about God. The second part of your outline is how God views failure. Number one, first of all, God values. There's value in our, fil- in our failure. There's value in our fil- failure. Can't talk this morning. God is able to keep you from stumbling. And he's able to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. Yet God also knows that in every failure, there are seeds of growth. Without failure, there will be no need for forgiveness, relationship, or help. Failure can be one of the greatest teachers that you'll ever have in life. God can take the most painful failures and defeats and use them as their greatest growth experiences. 
We all have failures in life. And God chooses to use them for his glory. Listen to what Romans 8.28 says. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. Failure teaches us what success cannot teach us. Failures can humble us and show us our limitations. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. You see, we're all going to go through failures in life. And we take those failures and we begin to value those failures because we look at them as learning experience. It's kind of like putting your hand on a hot stove. You only have to do it one time. There's a value there that says, you know what? If I put my hand on a hot stove, I'm going to get burned. For some of you guys are a little bit slower. Maybe it takes two or three times. But there's value in our failures. Number two is there's forgiveness in failure. I want to tell you something this morning. God's not surprised by your failures. God recognizes that we're humans. God recognizes that we were born with a sinful nature. But he's also prepared a way. He also knows that we're in a battle. Listen to what Ephesians 6, 12 says. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He says, I understand something. He goes, you are in a battle. And I want to tell you something. We think that our battles are this way. Our battles are really this way. Satan is going to do everything in, he, in his power to get you to try to fail, to turn away from God. And as a matter of fact, I, I want you to know something. Your battle is not with your spouse. It's not with your kids. It's not with your boss. Our battle is this way. Because we have to ask ourselves, God, what are you trying to teach me? Sometimes God says, hey, I'm not trying to change the situation. I'm trying to change you. A lot of times we feel pressures in life. We feel failures in life. So how can I get away from this? And God says, no, I want to work in you and through you in this situation. God brings forgiveness in our failures. When life is going well, it's easy to believe in a merciful, gracious, forgiving God. It's really in the trenches when we find out how mighty God is and that he's in control. Throughout Scripture, we see God's grace and forgiveness. Think about Adam and Eve. They were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve brought sin into the world. God provided a way of forgiveness. Moses killed an Egyptian and wandered in the desert for 40 years. Abraham got caught in a series of lies and half-truths and halfway following God. David committed adultery, murder, it cost him his integrity, a son. Yet he was known as a man after God's own heart. Jonah rejected God and got swallowed by a pretty big fish. Peter proclaimed loyalty to Jesus, then denied ever knowing him. Yet God brings forgiveness. He brings restoration. Number three, there's restoration and failures. Many people say, well, you know, I'm just not usable. I've messed up. You don't know what I've done. The truth of the matter is, I don't know what you've done, and I'm glad you don't know what all I've done. The truth of the matter is, none of us want our life up here on this big screen. None of us want all of our failures up here. But God says, I know them all, and I'm willing to forgive all. God said, and you are found usable because not what you've done, but because of what I've done. I want to tell you something. There's nothing that you've done that God can't forgive you for that not, God's not willing to forgive you for. You see, God wants to use you. I love how God comes back to Peter. As we read a little bit earlier, Peter had heard about the resurrected Christ. He goes running to the tomb. He sees and ends up seeing Jesus. But I want you to notice something the Scripture teaches us. Peter originally goes back to doing what Peter used to do. Him and the disciples went back to fishing. They're sitting on the beach one day, and then Jesus comes, and he goes, hey, cast her down on the other side. Kind of like he did when he first started to call Peter. 
And they begin to catch a large fish, a number of fish, and all of a sudden they recognize Jesus. And the scripture says, Peter literally dives into the water as fast as he can to get to Jesus on the shore. I'm sure Peter still had a lot going on in his mind. Lord, what do you think of me? And I love what Jesus says to Peter. He only has one question for him in John 21, 15 and 17. Jesus had called the disciples in and told them to fix them to eat. They're sitting there, and they had finished eating. This is what Jesus said, John 15, 21, 15. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because the Lord had asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus' simple response was, feed my sheep. When we come before God and we've fallen, we've failed Him. He doesn't berate us. He doesn't beat us down. He doesn't ask for a resolution for you to come and to resolve to do better. He actually asks for one thing. It's called reaffirmation. I want you to reaffirm my love. I want you to reaffirm your love for me. And He asked Peter one question. Peter do you really love me? You see, some of you walked in here this morning, you've you walked with all kinds of failures. You go, Pastor, you know, I used to follow God when I was a kid. Pastor, one time I was in a relationship with Jesus. Some of you walked in here and goes, you know what? Hey, I'm new to this whole church thing, and I don't even know about this Jesus. Other than I've heard that he died on the cross and he loves me. And the only thing he asks you this morning is one thing, do you love me? That's the only thing he asks you. Do you really love me? He said, if you love me, Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Will you follow me? Will you do what I've called you to do? You see, God wants to turn our failures into faith. God reinstated Peter that day. Peter, the one who denied Christ three times. The day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, and we'll talk about that another time. He said, Peter, you're the rock I'm going to build my church upon. Peter begins to preach, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to tell you, from that day forward, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it reinstated Peter, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit, was a totally different man. Peter never denied Christ after that. You know why? Because he knew the love of a Savior that loved him, that died for him. And he said, I'm not the same person God's changed me. As a matter of fact, through tradition, we understand that Peter actually loved Jesus so much that when they, they came to to uh, to martyr Peter. They came to kill him because of his faith. They looked at Peter and they had him and his wife and they said, Peter, denounce your faith or we're going to crucify your wife and you're going to watch. Peter said, my Lord, I'll never deny. And he sat there as they crucified his wife. Then to church history and tradition, we learn that when they got ready to crucify Peter, Peter said, I only have one request. I'm not worthy of being crucified the way that my Lord was crucified. And it through tradition, we understand that Peter was literally crucified upside down. He said, Lord, I love you because you love me. See, church, God's willing to forgive you because he loves you. We didn't come looking for God. He came looking for us. He said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. You may have walked in here this morning and said, Pastor, I've got a lot of failures. Can I tell you, we've got a big God that loves you and wants to forgive you. That he has a plan and a purpose for your life. And as long as you have breath, you're not disqualified. The shortest prayer of forgiveness ever recorded in history was a thief on the cross. His prayer of forgiveness was simply this. 
Lord, remember me. As long as you have breath, it's not too late. That's how much God loves you this morning. The second person we look at this morning is Thomas. You see, we all deal with doubt in life. We all have failures. We all deal with doubt. There are different types of doubt that we deal with in life. But I want to read you John chapter 20, 24 through 29 first, and it says this. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were together in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood with them, stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it on my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me, yet believed. You see, doubting Thomas is really no different than any of the other disciples. As a matter of fact, the other disciples on the road to Emmaus, they're walking to Emmaus. All their hopes and dreams have been crushed, and Jesus is sitting there walking and talking with them, and they didn't believe. Peter had to jump up and run himself to go see, because the other people said, hey, these women are crazy. You see, a lot of us have doubts in life, and in this modern day and time in the world, we're no different. We simply, in the church, a lot of times, we're not any different. As a matter of fact, we say, Lord, uh, you know, I believe in you, Lord, but I have trouble trusting you. I trust you. Can you handle this situation, God? God, can you handle my finances? Can you handle my children? Can you handle my job situation? You see, the truth of the matter is, when we're sitting here and we're fighting for control in our life, and we say, God, I've given you all the areas of my life except for this one area, God. I think I need to take care of this. We're saying, God, I doubt that you're able to handle me. God, I, I doubt that you're able to handle the situation. We're not a lot different from Thomas. Thomas was saying, hey, Lord, I'm not really sure about this. You see, the other disciples, they were not expecting a resurrected Savior. They were expecting an earthly king. But once he got the proof, Thomas didn't doubt anymore. You see, doubt is not wrong when it leads us to search for truth. As a matter of fact, some of you walked in here this morning, you're probably skeptical of church. You're skeptical of God. You're skeptical of the resurrection. What does this God really mean to me? And I want to tell you, there's three types of doubt that you'll deal with in life. Three types of doubt. A is factual. What are the facts? B is is emotional. It stems from your passions or your moods. And then C is volitional doubt. And that's the issues concerning one's will. Now, doubts many times also follow a pattern. When we look at doubt. Sometimes, someone will have unanswered factual questions. And it may bother them. This affects their emotions and their moods. And it leads to emotional doubt. Then, a lot of times they'll get upset with God for not meeting needs. And then they choose not to believe. So we have to ask ourselves a question. What type of doubt am I having? And how, number two, how do I respond to doubt, responding to doubt, number two? First, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of doubt do I have? What is the source? You see, factual doubt, when we have questions about facts, we just simply begin to ask questions. And then we begin to look at Christians. What are the evidences? The evidence is a resurrected Savior. One of the things we understand in Christianity, there is no other religion that has a resurrected Savior. Jesus Christ is the only God that has ever raised from the dead. So we begin to understand there's so many facts about Christianity, and I'm not going to do an apologetics lesson this morning, 
But there's so many, so many things that proves that we serve a risen Savior. Then we have what we call volitional doubt. Volitional doubt's the most dangerous. It's really a willful choice not to listen to truth. If somebody's dealing with volitional doubt, they need somebody who loves them to lovingly share truth. Then you have emotional doubt, which is the most common. People base their faith upon their emotions. How many times do we do that in life? If I feel good, everything's good. My, my faith and everything I believe is based upon my feelings, not facts, not truth. Many people walk through life like this. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast your anxiety or cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. So the third thing is, how do I overcome doubt? How do I overcome doubt? 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says this, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that you have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept for, in heaven for you, pure, undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay, and through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive the salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the last day for all to see. You see, church, all of us in here, we have failures. We all have doubts. We all have issues that we have to deal with. When we have doubts, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of doubt am I dealing with? It's like a doctor who prescribes medicine. You take the right medicine for the problem that you're having. When we're having doubts, the easiest way to overcome our doubt, Scripture tells us, is to praise Him. In Philippians chapter 4, 4 through 8, tells us something very different what the world says. The world says, you know what, if things are bothering you, go and clear your mind. Well, we recognize something. An empty mind is the devil's playground. The Scripture tells us something the exact opposite of Eastern meditation. Eastern meditation talks about emptying your mind. Scripture tells us the exact opposite, especially when we're dealing with doubt. It says, think upon things that are true. Anything that is worthy, anything that is noble, anything that is trustworthy. It says, if you can find one good thing, think about that thing. All of us in here, I don't care where you're at in life, when the enemy is attacking you, that you're dealing with doubts, that you're dealing with frustrations, I'm going to tell you what, you go back and you go into Scriptures, if the Bible is full of promises from God, and all of a sudden you begin to quote that promise to God, say, God, this is who you are. You're a God of love. You're a God of mercy. You're a God of forgiveness. You're a God of hope. And you can sit there and you can go start going through Scripture and you can start quoting Scripture and reminding the enemy that my God is able, that, you know what, I may have doubts, but God's going to deal with my doubts. I may have failures, but God's going to forgive me. God's not finished with me yet. And I don't know about you this morning, but I get excited that I begin to realize something, that God, I may, I may mess up, God, I may fail, but all you want to know, God, is one thing, do you love me? And I ask you guys that question this morning. Are you following a religion? Or do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? You see, on this Resurrection Sunday, on this Easter Sunday morning, I want to tell you something. The God of this universe desires a relationship with you. You see, I can know all the facts about somebody. I can sit up here and begin to quote you the facts about my favorite baseball player. I could tell you his stats, when he was born, where he was born at, what high school he played at, where he played at in the minor leagues. I could tell you anything that you wanted to know about him. I know all the facts, but I don't know him. You see, many of you know all the facts about Jesus. He was born of a virgin birth. He was born in a manger. There was actually a rock cut out into like a cave in the side of a hill. We could tell you his parents' name. We could tell you many of the great miracles that he did. 
We could tell you the fact that he died on the cross and three days later he rose from the dead. We can follow all the rules, quote unquote, that have been set before us. All the things we've been taught. But the question is, do you really know him? If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ where it's changing your life, you have to ask yourself a tough question. Does he really know me? You can know all the facts, but the question remains, do I know him? Is God changing my life? I'm going to tell you what the greatest joy that I have in life is serving Jesus Christ. God has changed my life so much in the last several years. You know, when I first came to the Eastgate Church of the Nazarene, um, it was many years ago, I didn't want to be here. As a matter of fact, my wife and I, I remember we were just dating at the time, and I told her I was coming here, and she laughed because she didn't think I'd ever come here. And I didn't want to be here. I'm just being honest with you guys. And I struggled at first. Pastor George was so gracious and so good to me. Taught me a lot of things over the years when I worked for him. And the longer I was here, the more I began to love the church. I loved what I was doing. But the longer I stayed here, the more I loved the people. The longer I was here, I realized how much the people loved me and my family. And the longer I've been here, the more that my faith has grown. The more that I love God, the more I love God, the more He loves me, the more that I love the church. And I love you enough to tell you this this morning. That I don't want to see any of you die and go to hell. Hell's real. Every day I get up in the morning, I pray for the church pray for you. There are several of you that every single day, your name's in my prayer journal. I pray for the entire church. But there are several of you that I pray for that, that I worry about your salvation. I worry about where you're going to spend your eternity. And I want to tell you this morning, you have a God that loves you. That no matter what you're going through in life right now, He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. But there is coming a time when he's coming to call his children home. And I love you enough to tell you that you better be ready. Because there will become a time, just like when Noah sealed that door in the ark, final judgment had come. There's coming a day that when God's going to call us home or either he's coming back. The question is, are we ready? You see, God understands that we've all sinned. He understands we've all fallen short of the glory. That's why he sent Jesus. He only asks you one question today. Do you love me? Do you love me? This morning, I'm going to ask you to stand and just, just to bow your heads this morning and just to close your eyes for just a moment. This morning, with every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe you walked in here this morning and said, You know what, Pastor? I've had failures. Maybe because of your failures, you've had doubts. Whatever it may be. Maybe you felt so distant from God. But today you know that you're standing in the presence of an almighty God. And he's asking you a question. Do you love me? 
If you're standing here today and your desire is to reaffirm your love for God and say, God, I love you. God, I want to be in a relationship with you. Would you raise your hand where you're at this morning? Amen. I see your hand. Anybody else? I see several hands all around the church. You can put them down. This morning now, I just want to tell you our altars are always open in our church. And if you want to come down here and pray today, and you just simply want to say, God, I, I need forgiveness. God, my desire is to be in a relationship with you like never before. God, I want to come down here today, Lord, just to simply tell you that I love you. I want to invite you to come as we sing through this song. Would you come this morning?